Our guest today is the United States Attorney for the Northern District of Illinois. He has been a federal prosecutor for over 20 years and began serving the Northern District 10 years ago. Our guest today is a top federal law enforcement official for the 18 counties across the top tier of Illinois with a population of roughly nine million people. He gained national recognition by prosecuting the United States versus Osama bin Laden case following the bombings of the embassies in Kenya and Tanzania in 1998. Chicago Magazine has called him, and I quote, the mob-busting, terrorist-chasing prosecutor from New York City tabbed as the outsider to clean up the town, unquote. Uh, he and his wife, Jenny, have two beautiful children, Connor and Declan. Ladies and gentlemen, the United States Attorney for the Northern District of Illinois, Patrick Fitzgerald. Pat, all right, thank you. Thank you. I thought I'd focus my remarks today on looking back on our anniversary that we held yesterday uh, of the attacks uh, 10 years ago and focus on some thoughts about what we've done right in the last 10 years, what we could have done better, what has changed, and what, I, what I'm worried about going forward. And I, I'll express this as my personal views of things I've seen and how I've reacted to it, not an official view of the government or the Department of Justice. Uh, the one thing I would say is that looking at things after 10 years is an appropriate time frame. Uh, I think I, I spoke here September 11th, 2002. And I remember people thinking we had went a year without an attack on our homeland of any serious dimension. And I remember being jarred by the timeline that Al-Qaeda is on. Um, Al-Qaeda uh, plans things many years in advance. When they bombed our embassies in 1998, they surveilled them five years before. When they tried to kill President Mubarak in Ethiopia in 1995, they set up shop along a roadway th two years earlier instead of a full-time business just to be in the right spot. So we're dealing with an enemy with a very, very long time frame. So looking at things after 10 years rather than one year is the right way to look at it. So let me talk about um, um, where things have improved since before 9-11. The single most striking thing that, that jars me from my days as a line assistant in New York working terrorism cases to the present is how fundamentally we've changed our approach and how fundamentally we've changed information sharing. From a very small legal doctrine, a huge change has been made. Back in the 90s, we had a concern based upon legitimate reasons that we wanted to keep intelligence and law enforcement separate. There was a concern that certain law enforcement tools and certain investigative tools for uh, terrorism and espionage should not be mixed. So people uh, kept them separate and apart. From that, we had a fundamental flaw in how we went about uh, trying to prevent terrorism. I'll give you an analogy and I'll give you two very concrete examples. Imagine if you were doing something a lot less serious than trying to keep your country safe and you were playing football. Imagine if you were in defense and instead of one huddle you split into two and you simply said those are the intel folks and those are the law enforcement folks. They should both defend what's about to happen but they're not allowed to talk to each other. That is how we were defending against terrorism in the 1990s. We would be in New York, we would hear about different terrorists or suspects being in our city. And as law enforcement, we could talk to the FBI about what we were doing in law enforcement investigations concerning those folks. But if they were doing an intelligence investigation, we could not discuss it. We weren't even supposed to know that. So sometimes we would hear that there were people in our midst that may cause a problem, and we wouldn't know whether their phones were being tapped, whether they're being followed, because we weren't allowed to be read into the intelligence side of the house. Two very concrete examples. When a team of us were working on the Osama bin Laden investigation and Al-Qaeda in the mid-1990s, we talked to everyone. We talked to police, we talked to law enforcement, overseas law enforcement. We actually flew overseas and sat down and met with Al-Qaeda members. Now, they were not happy Al-Qaeda members. One of them had been caught stealing money from Osama bin Laden, so we met him overseas, um, and he became our first Al-Qaeda witness and joined the witness protection program but we were meeting with an Al-Qaeda member. What we couldn't do was meet with the FBI agent across the street in New York City who was doing the intelligence investigation of Al-Qaeda. We could meet with the CIA, we met with foreign spies, 
but a system where you can meet with al-Qaeda, but not an FBI agent, was upside down. Another example was in 1998, following the embassy bombings, it's now public that we subpoenaed a US citizen living in California to a grand jury in New York. We examined him in the grand jury and believed he was lying. We knew he was about to board a plane overseas to Egypt. And our choice was whether to make a decision in a couple of hours about bringing a perjury charge against someone who just testified in the grand jury or let him go. We knew that there was an intelligence investigation of, his, of this person. We knew there had been a search. But we weren't allowed to know what had been obtained in that search. I remember talking to my boss, Mary Jo White, the US attorney at the time, who decided we had to charge him. It was too dangerous to let him go. So we made a decision looking at half the cards in our hand. After we arrested him, he would later come into court and plead guilty. He had been a former Egyptian uh, military member for 17 years. He had worked at the Fort Bragg Special Warfare Center for three years. He admitted in court that he had trained Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan. He trained Ayman Zawahiri, the current head of Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. He had trained several of the World Trade Center bombers from 1993. He had arranged bin Laden's security. He, put, he arranged a meeting between bin Laden and Mugania, the head of Hezbollah. He had cased the American embassies that had just been bombed five years earlier in 1993 and showed the charts to bin Laden. And admitted in court, had we not arrested him then, he would have headed back to Afghanistan. There we were making a decision whether to let this person go or stay, knowing there was information we couldn't see. After uh, September 11th, as a result of a Patriot Act, which I'll discuss more in a minute, that changed. It no longer became important for people to figure out whether your dominant purpose was law enforcement or intelligence. We could now talk. For the last 10 years, or it took about a year to really get it going, we now sit down on a very regular basis with the FBI and ask them everything they're doing as part of a task force with the local police, uh, with other folks. We're allowed to know who the threats are out there. We're allowed to discuss what they're doing. There's very little we can't know. We won't reveal it in court. But now we can sit around and discuss whether or not a certain person who poses a threat is being covered by law enforcement uh, or people using law enforcement techniques versus intelligence. We have one huddle. That, to me, is a completely different world. When David Headley appeared on the radar screen in Chicago a few years ago, when we sat around doing the investigation and trying to figure out what he was involved in, law enforcement prosecutors uh, and the FBI were married at the hip. And we came to the conclusion shortly before he was about to head overseas that we should arrest him. And after he was arrested, we would learn after he was Mirandized, and I'll talk about Miranda in a moment, that he had been involved in the attacks in Mumbai in 2008 in which more than 160 people were killed. The idea these days that we get to sit down and look at all our cards is a huge development. The other thing I would say is watching that example and how we handled the investigation showed me how much more agile we are as a government. What used to take months, if not years, in terms of getting approvals in the process, now we're reduced to days and sometimes hours. So I remember being very, very uh, taken by watching how well people worked, how smoothly people worked. And the attitude among law enforcement and intelligence community is to share information. It used to be, why should I share something with you? What is your need to know? And if someone finds out I shared it, how am I going to justify myself to my boss that I gave out that information? That's been reversed. People now think, what is my duty to share? And if it's found out that I have information that I didn't share with someone, how am I going to justify to myself that I sat on it? That has been a sea change over the last 10 years and one I think is very fundamentally important. That's the good news. The second part of this is what have we not done so well? I can tell you what we haven't done so well is the public discourse about the tension between civil liberties and national security. Um, I'm all for a rigorous debate on why we would do certain things or not do certain things or about the best way to do certain things. But the debate has not been rigorous from either side of the aisle. Some people uh, pushing national security um, denigrate folks who are concerned about civil liberties and vice versa. And the best example of that was the Patriot Act. I'm a fan of the Patriot Act for the reasons I explained before, that brought, it brought down the wall between law enforcement and intelligence. But I'm not here to lecture that the Patriot Act, you should all like it. But having watched the Patriot Act debates, because I participated in a lot of them in the Chicago area for a couple of years, I was really disappointed to see how little people understood about what the Patriot Act was. Many people showed up at the Patriot Act debates because they were angry about 
the existence of a facility at Guantanamo Bay. And if you tried to tell them that the Patriot Act had nothing to do with it, that if the Patriot Act was repealed, that the next day nothing different would happen at Guantanamo Bay, they could not believe you. I remember appearing in front of the city council and watching people say that what happened at Guantanamo Bay justified repealing the Patriot Act and telling them if that's their concern, they need to address the issue of Guantanamo Bay, which has nothing to do with it, and being hissed. It is not a good way of making policy the way we have a rancorous debate where people reduce things to bumper stickers instead of kicking the tires to find out what the facts are. And I'll come back to that in a moment. The one thing I, I tell my, my friends about the Patriot Act is there are two types of people who showed up at the debates. The people who hated the Patriot Act and wanted you to sort of tell them what it was that they hated. Um, and the people who didn't like the Patriot Act to me as much as people who hated the people who hated the Patriot Act. <laughs> Um, and wanted to tell you why it was that they should not like those people. Um, and that's not a very encouraging way to go about setting public policy. Um, now let me focus on one thing that's changed that I think we all realize has changed, but um, um, is something that's uh, really gripping when I look back at the case that we charged back in 1998. And that's the role that the military is now playing in our fight against terror. It was often said after 9-11 that our approach to terrorism was a law enforcement approach that law enforcement was sitting around waiting for people to commit these heinous acts so they could grab them and prosecute them. I've always been offended by that, the notion that people thought we were sitting around allowing bombings to happen so we could prosecute and thought it was a terribly inaccurate bumper sticker. What was happening back then is people in law enforcement were trying to present a law enforcement option to deal with certain situations, fully recognizing there were military, intelligence, diplomatic options. And to see how the world has changed, I looked at, um, I keep a copy of the Bin Laden indictment in my drawer in my office, and I pulled it out, and we had roughly 20 defendants on that indictment and uh, a couple of related charges. And in the period from 1998, the summer when the embassies were bombed, before 9-11, uh, out of those 20-something defendants, 11 defendants were arrested. Um, by my count, three were arrested in Kenya, one was arrested in South Africa, one in Germany, three in England, and three in the United States. And as a result, going forward, a number of them were tried. Interestingly, the three that were arrested in England are still in England awaiting extradition. Um, but for those three, the rest have been convicted. All of those who were convicted and did not cooperate uh, were sentenced to life uh, imprisonment without the possibility of parole. What happened after September 11th, from September 11th to this time, to my belief, one defendant has been arrested and charged. That was Ahmed Kalfan Galani, who was arrested, brought to Guantanamo Bay, then brought to New York, and was tried last year. There was a lot of outcry when he was convicted of just one count, but not enough attention was paid to the fact that at the end of that, he was sentenced to life without parole. What happened to the other defendants? Well, interestingly, num the number two in Al-Qaeda at the time of the 9-11 bombings, Mohammed Atef, um, called Abu Hafs, was killed in a bombing raid in Al-Qaeda safe, ho safe house in late November 2001. And according to open press reporting in 2009, two of the other defendants were killed uh, in drone strikes uh, in Afghanistan. And then obviously on May 11th of this year, Osama bin Laden, who was the top defendant in the indictment, was killed in the raid by the Navy SEALs. And a month later, the lead operative on the ground for the Kenyan bombings, a man by the name of Haroon Fazul, who we just missed capturing in, a, in, a, uh, in um, Kenya in 1998, and became the leader of Al-Qaeda in East Africa, was killed at a checkpoint in Somalia. So what I saw from 1998 to 2001, we saw 11 defendants be arrested. From 2001 to 2011, it seems that we've had at least five of the defendants reported killed, and the one fugitive remains. It reminds me how much we owe our military and how much more the military plays a role in the fight against terror than it did not too long ago. And the final point. We're, what we risk going forward. I express my concerns about the Patriot Act and how the debate, I think, often got reduced to bumper stickers. And that was frustrating, but the concern to me is letting bumper stickers dictate our policy. And I hear another bumper sticker coming up uh, more recently about how we deal with Article Three civilian courts. And let me give you the argument that you will hear reduced to its most simple form. The argument is we're at war, so why don't we stop using those law enforcement tools? We're at war. Why do we want to treat them as cops and robbers? That somehow we'll be less safe. It's a very appealing argument because it's very catchy 
and it's very simple. And when I tell you, it's also a very dangerous argument. We cannot reduce things to bumper stickers. I am not here to advocate that the solution to the terrorism problem is prosecutions. I know that. I knew that 10 years ago that it's not. I'm not here to advocate that we ought to always use Article III civilians court or even use them most of the time. What I am here to tell you is to make a pitch that we'd be crazy to say that we'd never use Article III civilian courts to deal with people we capture alive. And let me walk you through that. I think sometimes people ask the question, so how should we handle terrorism? Article III civilian courts, the ordinary courts that we deal with for criminal problems, or should we use military commissions? And that's the wrong question. The question is, what tool should we use in a particular case? Because facts are stubborn things, and you need to get down there and really analyze the facts of a particular case. So let me tell you some of the things that um, bring home to me why it is we can't just rule out using our ordinary criminal court system for some of these cases. First, one thing people don't understand is that the scope of military commissions are limited. There are far more crimes that you can prosecute in Article III civilian courts than you can prosecute in military commissions. And there are far more subjects that you can prosecute. What the average person I don't think appreciates is that military commissions, by definition, do not apply to all terrorists. If we catch a Hezbollah terrorist, a Hamas terrorist, a terrorist from the FARC in Colombia, they are not subject to the jurisdiction of a military commission. That's off the table. They don't apply to lone wolf domestic terrorists, militia members, or people who would attack us within the United States. They don't even apply to terrorists in the United States inspired by Al-Qaeda who do not belong to Al-Qaeda. Someone who is radicalized on the internet and tries to drive a truck bomb into a building uh, in, a, in a major metropolitan city is not within the jurisdiction of the military commissions. So when people argue the bumper sticker, we should stop using this law enforcement in the war on terror. What they may not realize is, for some cases, that is the only option. The second part is that military commissions don't apply to U.S. citizens. If we were to capture some of the U.S. citizens who were involved with some of the terrorist groups, we would have no ability to put them on trial in the military commission system. If we were to disable our Article III civilian courts, we would be saying we cannot prosecute them at all. A third thing we miss is that our civilian court systems have a remarkable ability to generate incentives for people to cooperate. That sounds abstract, um, but it's not. It's amazing how long it takes a person in custody to figure out what their incentives are. When we were in Africa interviewing the embassy bombers, Pretty quickly, they wanted to know what their status was back in America. We flew overseas to meet an Al-Qaeda member, a second Al-Qaeda member, who we knew by the rules of the country we were in. We could not arrest him there. We made a pitch to him that said, if you come back with us, we're going to charge you with conspiracy to carry out terrorist acts. You will face life imprisonment. If you say no, we will leave you here. But we may see you again someday, and the terms will be different. And we mentioned the Witness Protection Program, we mentioned immigration status for children, and remarkably, this Al-Qaeda member agreed to come back voluntarily, testify, and plead guilty in court. People don't realize how important law enforcement can be as an intelligence collection tool. We saw that in the David Headley case. The ability to take a person, have them plead guilty, and incentivize them to provide information is a very powerful tool we need for national security. And uh, one, uh, one last point I'll focus on is the greater international acceptance of our Article III civilian courts. I know some of you are quietly groaning. You're thinking, what do we care about what other countries think? And I know there's a substantial school of thought who think we should care what other countries think. We want public acceptance. We want Americans to be accepted overseas, and that's an important value. Others say that counts for nothing. Uh, we shouldn't care what other countries think, and we shouldn't outsource our counterterrorism policy to what they say. I make this pitch on a practical ground. There are countries that will not surrender terrorists to us in their custody, absent a promise we won't try them uh, in military commissions. So while it's great for us to sometimes talk about whether or not we should say we should not try people in civilian courts, if we say we will never try people in Article III civilian courts, and then we find someone overseas in a country that won't extradite from military commissions, we're basically saying, let them go. Now, having said all that, there are downsides. There are advantages to a military commission system. One of the things about a military commission system is that there's greater use of hearsay. Uh, you can let in some statements without calling witnesses. 
that can make a huge difference in some cases where the evidence that you have really needs that difference. I say that with a couple of caveats. Uh, first of all, that hearsay is still within constitutional limits. And secondly, I don't know this firsthand, but in reading about an account of the Hamdan prosecution in the military commissions, it sounds like the defendant made even greater use of the hearsay rules. So when you go to a military commission system, there may be advantages for the government presentation by relying on hearsay, but there may also be uh, advantages for the defendant to do the same. Secondly, in the military commission system, Miranda, uh, providing Miranda is not required. The test in the military commission system is whether or not the statements are voluntary, which is different from the Article III civilian courts, and that can be important. But again, I note a footnote. I'm concerned that we've bumpered sticker uh, Miranda into some quaint relic of the past that will always cost law enforcement. And I can tell you there are concrete examples that I could fill for a half an hour of why Miranda often does not get in the way and in some cases can actually enhance our ability to protect ourselves. I know that sounds strange, but think of a case like Headley. Headley was Mirandized. Headley was provided his Miranda rights and then made a full confession, including a confession to the Mumbai attacks with which he had not been charged. Once a person has made a Mirandized confession, the government has great leverage over them because they can be charged. Now you have a person who's a defendant who will hear and talk to his counsel about the fact that his confession is now admissible before a jury and it will be admissible because they're Mirandized. My concern is that people have such a bad reaction now to the word Miranda that they think the only sensible thing to do in all circumstances is to avoid reading people's rights. And I fear the day that we do that and lose a confession that the person would have given anyway that we could use to hold over their head to obtain their cooperation. So I think one of the things we ought to bear in mind when people talk about military commissions is it is an advantage to be able to admit statements without providing Miranda, but we shouldn't carry that too far because in the right circumstances, we may want Miranda to make sure we have a case that allows us to detain the person and hopefully leverage them to talk. And two other notes, and I'm not saying these are exhaustive, it's easier in the military commissions to close the courtrooms as appropriate. It's easier to deal with classified information. And in non-capital cases, the standard of conviction is easier. You require two-thirds uh, a vote to convict in a military commission instead of a unanimous vote. Now, you could, you could write articles for hours, uh, talk for hours about the difference between the two systems. And I'm just trying to give you a taste of the fact that it is not an easy call. Uh, a fellow named David Chris used to be the Assistant Attorney General for the National Security Division. He gave a speech to the Brookings Institution outlining a lot of the comparisons between Article III courts, the military commissions, and, and other approaches. And one of the points he made there that I thought was very important was he made the point that those who argue that we should never use the civilian court system could also argue we should never use diplomacy. We all know that in dealing with problems in the world, sometimes diplomacy works and sometimes it doesn't. But if we were to make a rule that said when we're dealing with a crisis overseas, the only thing we will not do is ever consider diplomacy, we would hurt ourselves. And we would rue the day that we avoided an option to engage in conflict because of you know, not using diplomacy. It doesn't mean diplomacy is the answer. One of the tools we have to fight the war and terror is law enforcement. It is a tool, it is not the tool. In many cases, it may well be the wrong tool. But in those cases where it is the right tool, or it is the only tool, we would deserve the public and deserve what we've done over the last 10 years we, if we let a bumper sticker on the fact that we're at war control how we think about going about our problems. And with that, I thank you for your attention. If you have a question, remember, remember this, cowards die many times before their death. The valiant taste death but once. Write your question, sign your name, and I'll ask it of the U.S. Attorney. What? Someone left their keys in a cab. Full service city club? No problem. Uh, Al Manning, I hope you're, you know what you're talking about. Here we go, Mr. Attorney. Did you read the novel by David Ellis, Breach of Trust? This is not a quiz. <laughs> if so, would you comment? If not, what is the reaction of your staff? Please comment on the details of wiretaps. 
You could say, if you haven't read it, to the best of your recollection or whatever. Um, I, I haven't read it, and I don't know the reaction of my staff. I, there's lots of books out there, and I'm aware of that book, but we haven't read it. Okay. okay. Not off to a great start. Let's, 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 let's just, uh, just, just, just so we get that clear. Uh, um, and by the way, I will be incredibly polite today, as you can only imagine. Uh, Steve Brenner. Steve, where are you? You made the room. Okay. If it is a federal crime to publish the name and job description of an undercover CIA agent, why was columnist Robert Novak, who committed such an act, not indicted in the Libby case? Now we're cooking. I can't say I didn't read the column, huh? No. <laughs> um, yeah. um, I, could, I would just say this. I'm not going to get into who was charged and not charged in that case. But I can say it's a general policy. It's very clear that people treat reporters very differently than government officials. And if you look at the statute, the statute usually prohibits someone who has an obligation to keep classified information, um, has a duty on disclosing it, and I won't go beyond that. Uh, Annie McKibben, Annie, where are you? Oh, all in the back. Notice they're all in the back. Okay. CNT Energy. Oh, here's a good question. What is your three top ways those in this room can build a more ethical culture in Illinois? I'll, I'll reduce it to one. Um, seriously, speak up. Um, the one thing that I find frustrating is people view corruption as a law enforcement problem. And if I could have a dollar for everyone who's ever come up to me after we've convicted someone to say, yes, we knew he or she was doing that all the time and we wondered when someone's gonna get around to do something about it. And I bite my lip, but I wanna just smack them upside the head and say, <laughs> well, the person that you wanted to do something about it was you. Um, and it's my view that sometimes we say like, well, that's the way it is uh, in Illinois. Or we say that's the way it is in Chicago. And if you find yourself saying that, then what you're really saying is that's the way I'm allowing it to be. Because if you're in a business situation or any kind of situation and you see someone who's taking advantage or someone who's doing something improper, then you either speak up and do something about it or you're part of the problem. And it's not, you know, that's the only way you can look at it. And, and don't conveniently leave it on the shoulders of the FBI to do something about it. It's time for people to sort of make clear that they won't put up with it. Okay. Uh, we have uh, two questions on a subject you probably won't answer, but they're good questions. Uh, one is Reuben Hedlund, who uh, asks, has the Department of Justice decided what it will recommend for the sentencing of the ex-governor? And this guy, Paul Green, who compliments you on your speech, but asks a more local question, will former Governor Blagojevich be sentenced on October 6? And uh, the be short answer is I, I believe the sentencing is scheduled for October 6th. And we'll wait and see if for any reason that's delayed. Um, and the judge will find out what we recommend for sentencing when we send him some form of letter or writing, not from the news clips of today. So I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, you still owe me back there. So uh, I'm still co I'll still collect. Uh, <laughs> Lawrence Olivier. And who says we don't have class? Uh, who or what gets primary credit for the absence of a post-terrorist attack on the U.S. soil. And that's Lawrence Oliver, who used to work in the office, and, and there's uh, several people, uh, alums of the office, as well as present members here today. Uh, I think there's a whole lot that goes into that. I think people always want to take credit for things. I think part of it is just citizens being much more alert. I think a lot of it is local law enforcement. I think one thing that the federal government appreciates is that the eyes and ears on the ground that see something suspicious are a whole you know, a level of magnitude greater when you deal with local police. Every major terrorist plot or incident, there's a great chance that the first encounter with a terrorist is made by a state trooper, by a local police officer, whether it's in the U.S. or overseas. So I think they've been much more vigilant. And then I think the changes in, in practices, I mean, FBI agents, CIA personnel, Homeland Security, uh, local police all work extremely hard, and I think the information sharing has been great. But it's been a common burden, and the average citizen is going through things at the airport that they didn't have to do before. And that's a price we have to pay, but it's that vigilance that, that, that makes it all happen. So I don't think there's a single moment or thing that we've done 
It's been a collective effort. But I do think on the federal side, we fully recognize how much the state and local police officers um, and Homeland Security officials have contributed. Uh, Joe Thornton from the American Medical Association. And Joe, I'm not sure I understand your question, but I'll read it as is. Uh, I hope you don't, this is to you, sir, <laughs> not to me, I'm sure. I hope you don't leave, but do you think, I hope you don't leave Illinois, but do you think you would find federal agencies and officials engaged in the, sh oh, I see, in, in, engaged in the same shenanigans you have prosecuted here? In other words, it's just this the bottom of the barrel, I guess. I, I just, I will say this, and I've, I've said it recently when, when I met with the Tribune, I, I consider Chicago home, so I don't want to speak ill of my home. I don't think we're the only um, city or state that has a corruption problem. I think we have, there are problems elsewhere. But I do think part of what we need to do is to motivate the citizenry to step up more and scream louder and not put up with it. And I think the, the next step in the fight against corruption is going to come from people just speaking up. And having people be in a situation where if they have the ability to shake someone down or ask for something, if they're in any level of government, they ought to be more fearful of the person coming in, picking up the phone and calling the FBI, uh, than having the person coming in fearful of being asked. And I think if we do more of that, we'll make a big difference. Okay. We have three more questions. So, uh, and Rachel, I'm asking your question, but your last name is Good. Goodstein, okay. When can you come back and speak on corruption, convictions, and what has been learned over the past 10 years since your appointment? It's kind of a general question. I gotta check with Randy. Randy keeps, uh, tells me when to speak and when not to speak. Randy's a press officer, but well, I'll, I'll be open to coming back in the future, so. Uh, well, you know, there's a city club rule, so we just broke one. Now, no more questions, okay? I don't want a culture of corruption to affect the city club uh, because we are city club Americans. Here we go. North, uh, Elliot, Elliot, next time write in ink. Uh, Northwestern Law School, what is your office doing to get ahead of crimes not yet committed? That's a, that's a great question, and I think what we lose sight of is how much of our effort is focused on violent crime. Um, and I think in our office, we have about 160 something attorneys. Maggie Hickey's here and she could tell me the exact number, but it's in the ballpark. Of that, about 130 or so are doing criminal work. Of that, more than 42 are assigned to drugs and gangs full time. Of the remaining, beyond those 42, any number of them are burdened with drug and gang cases they take with them and they move on to other sections. So the largest amount of resources go into violent crime. I think what people may not appreciate because law enforcement has changed in the last decade is how intelligence driven we are and how much our partnerships are driven on violent crime by working with the local police departments to indicate who are the most dangerous threats to us, what are the most dangerous hotspots so that we're not doing the cases that come in our inbox, we're doing the cases that are focused at the people who pose the greatest threat. I was talking to the, the good father before, I think people also don't realize how much we work with social service providers in that we wanna make an impact in a neighborhood where there is something out there that can make a difference. One of our greatest victories was in Aurora when we prosecuted the insane deuces and there were a couple of dozen murders one year and the year of the trial, we woke up uh, to a radio announcement around Labor Day that the first homicide had been committed in Aurora. That was an impact because violence dipped because of a case. We don't have that impact when we make uh, cases in Chicago without trying really hard. And so one of the things we like to do is keep track of what social service agencies there are, uh, what agencies there are to help felons re-entering society, and try to marry up our enforcement efforts with those efforts. So the key to us is it numbers of people we arrest, it's the impact we make uh, on the violence rate. And with that, since I realize I have a much more captive audience than usual, uh, is the one thing I think people underestimate is the effect that we're having by felons coming back into the city who are looking for jobs and can't get them. And I know it's tough economic times, period. Uh, it's even harder to have a person with a criminal record get a job. But we have to deal with that issue. And one of the things that has struck me is looking at felons looking for, to reenter society is the folks that want to leave prison and work are self-selecting out. I know everyone has that view that if you hire a felon 
what is going to happen when they grab a rifle and do whatever you think they're going to do, and then your boss is going to look at you and say, why did you bring that person here? Well, it's very easy to go back being a gangbanger. You just go back to where you came from. You join the same people uh, who are still alive uh, from when you left, and you do what you want to do. When you get up and go across town and spend money to try and get jobs that pay um, minimum wage, that's people who have realized that prison is not working for them, the gang life is not working for them, and they want to change their lives. And one of the dirty little secrets, which isn't so dirty, is that I think a lot of businesses have been hiring felons and found out that they have a better track record than other employees. And there are organizations out there who will organize them and supervise them, and the employers who are hiring felons are not doing it as a do-good thing. They're doing it as a good business proposition. But they don't like to advertise that uh, because of the stigma associated with it. So one of the things we as a community have to address is if we're going to deal with the violence problem and the continuing um, problems in, in society in Chicago, we have to step up and start thinking about those larger issues and taking those people who are willing to turn their lives around and finding a way in very, very tough economic times to make that work. Two real short questions. Jan Grayson from BGA. Why so few financial industry, industry prosecutions for pre-2008 activity? That, that's a topic for, it would take too long to go through. I mean, we're obviously want to be vigilant about what's happening in the financial sector. We have a financial crime section. We're finding lots of different frauds. We're going after mortgage fraud and we're going after um, the amazing number of Ponzi schemes, uh, which struck me as how many Ponzi schemes are out there where a $20 million Ponzi scheme is, is almost tiny these days. And I think we did some um, dozens and dozens last year of Ponzi schemes, and the total number of money, I think, was uh, uh, in the billions of what's involved. So I think we're going about a lot of prosecutions, but I think sometimes people just want um, a sort of a, a sense that uh, everything that happened in the market has to do with crime. And I think we have to peel back and look at what happened in the market that dealt with crime and what happened in the market that dealt with a lot of bad judgment um, and can't just assume that we're going to see the markets do things we don't want them to do and think the answer is just to run out and indict people without peeling back and finding out whether it was bad business, whether it was corrupt conduct, and whether we can prove it. And the last short question, uh, again, we break the city club rules because if you make them, you could break them. Uh, however, not in the federal court, I know that. <laughs> How, and make this within 20. How many potential targets are in this room? <laughs> you don't have to answer that. I could just guess several. How about a big round of applause? <laughs>